about a robbery and then complete the notes from the detective's notebook. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John Brings is at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after 11.30, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the uh, building society and asked to see the manager. Uh, there were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe. Uh, it came to about $25,000. Presumably you have a number of witnesses. Yes, uh, we have a good description of both of them. Uh, the man was about 1 meter 80 centimeters, around 35 years of age, with blue eyes and short curly red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mr. Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that may be his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And what about the woman? Now, she is in her early 20s, slim and quite tall, about 1 meter 70 centimeters. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose-fitting, and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag which they used to hide the gun in. She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and, like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number. And it's G595ERI. I'll say that again. It's G595ERI. Now, the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago, so if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen, and is still broken, we think. So, you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognize the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon and the telephone number is 774529. So we would like people to ring us if they have any information. Uh, and of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, is 774529. And now back to the studio.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about facilities for students with disabilities. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. Welcome to Student Times, the programme with all the latest on what's happening at universities around the country. Today we'll be discussing disabled applicants and the kind of support they can expect to find, or not find, at the university of their choice. With me to tell us more is Student Disability Advisor Sally Taylor. Good morning, Sally. Good morning, Hugh. I'd like to start by pointing out that although one in four people has some kind of disability, the proportion among students is much lower. This is partly because most students are under 25 and many people only develop their disabilities as they get older, but it's also because some universities don't do much to encourage access. Mm. It is true, though, that some have quite sticky problems when it comes to, um, for instance, wheelchair access, um, ancient buildings, cobbled streets built centuries ago, and so on. When faced with such a situation, some universities make an extra special effort to provide for students with particular disabilities, while others have specialist accommodation. In fact, all universities should have a written policy statement on students with disabilities, setting out what facilities they have, what their attitude is, and what they're prepared to do. But having said that, only you can properly understand the challenges of any disability you have, and so before accepting a place at a university, or even while you're considering applying, if only to raise the university's awareness, it's good to talk to them and find out how much they can and will do for you. The problem is who to talk to. Most universities and some students' unions have a disability advisor who is supposed to know what facilities they already have and will help with further arrangements if necessary or possible. However, all too often this person is a token. Sometimes it's just an extra responsibility given to a secretary. They don't know what the situation is in practice and they don't have any real authority to change anything. So, given that for any prospective student it's best to visit a university before applying, it's an especially good idea for students with disabilities or special needs to check whether the place really does come up to scratch. Uh -huh. In general, the university should provide personal care and assistance, and there are certain key features to look out for if you have a particular disability, including the following. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen 
and answer questions 14 to 20. Firstly, if your mobility is impaired, check there are ramps and easy access to all buildings, not just accommodation or teaching rooms. Then, when you're inside, look for clear instructions on fire and emergency procedures for the disabled. Also, make sure there are lifts that work, not the usual ones that seem to be out of order half the time. And check for suitable lavatory facilities. There is a different set of things to look for if you suffer from any kind of hearing impairment. There should be induction loops in lecture theatres, flashing sirens in all rooms and, in accommodation, visual doorbells that light up when somebody calls round to see you. If it is your sight that is impaired, there obviously need to be braille translators of books and documents. In all buildings, the stairs, floors, doorways and windows must have clear markings and there also have to be special fire and emergency procedures for you. If you suffer from dyslexia, you will need a computer for general use and in exams. And as exams may take you longer to complete, you should be allowed extra time in which to do so. This applies to work in general too. There are of course many other possible health difficulties that you may suffer from, such as diabetes, epilepsy or heart conditions. If this is the case, check the availability of access to appropriate treatment, including medication and or therapy. Finally, make sure that in the event of an emergency, it is clear what you and other people who may be involved have to do. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So, where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Centre. Right. Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages. Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray, though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> and there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr. Rowe said there was a library? Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside, and it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernized area. Definitely. They actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones. 
the mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was okay. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions, and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water. Things like sources such as rivers and wells, and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr. Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur, that was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards. Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run. But it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own. And it was a real eye-opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project. But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation. So it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear an extract from a talk about student health and specifically about ways to avoid headaches. Listen to what the speaker says and complete the summary. First, look at questions 30 to 40. As you listen to the talk, answer questions 30 to 40. Complete the summary.
Hello. Welcome to the Student Orientation Program. Today's session is on health issues, and this talk is about headaches and how to avoid them. It may surprise you to hear that headaches are often caused by hunger. In fact, one study suggested that 70% of headaches are related to hunger, which makes it the principal cause. The advice is simple. Eat three meals a day and try to keep to a fairly regular schedule of meals. People associate noise with headaches, and for most of us, excessive noise creates the conditions for a headache. Very loud noise is unpleasant, and people usually remove themselves from it. Having said that, younger people tend to tolerate noise better than their elders, so I may be leaving noisy places far earlier than you. Just remember that exposure to too much noise may predispose you to a headache. Of course, we all associate headaches with studying. In fact, the headache probably doesn't come from the studying so much as from being tense. When we study hard, we often hunch over our work. Try raising your shoulders and tensing them, and now relax. Can you feel how much more comfortable a relaxed stance is? Another thing, it's very important to check that you are working in a good light. It will not actually hurt your eyes to work in a bad light, but it will make you tired very quickly and is very likely to give you a headache. What's more, if you have the book flat on a desk in front of you, it will be harder to read and you'll have to hold your head at an odd angle. It is wise to have a book rest, which raises the material you are reading 45 degrees to the desk. This will help reduce your chance of a headache. Try to relax before bed so that you will be relaxed when you try to sleep. A soak in a hot bath may be helpful. It's also important to really sleep when you go to bed. A good mattress is a wise investment for people who want to avoid headaches. This talk seems to keep coming back to tension. Tension may cause you to chew too forcefully, clench your jaw or grind your teeth, and this in turn may lead to headaches. It is very easy to say that you shouldn't grind your teeth and very hard to stop, particularly if you grind your teeth in your sleep. Try to avoid situations which will make you tense, particularly just before bed. If you do compulsively grind your teeth in your sleep, Ask your dentist about a soft mouth guard. In general, try to eat regular meals and avoid tense situations. Be sure you get plenty of exercise. Hopefully your headaches will be greatly reduced. One other thing I should point out, avoid smoky rooms and cars. Such places certainly encourage headaches and the smoke may be doing you quite serious long-term damage. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.